Hey, Timberline, we're going to be in Ephesians 6 today, so I encourage you to go ahead and have your Bibles there. So as I was putting together this message, I was wrestling with um, the fact that we're, we're gathering together, well, many of us are, are gathering together in the building today. And so there's this idea that we're going to celebrate the truth of the gospel, the fact that we've been saved and united, and this is why we are here. And so there's this, this side of just celebration that I want to bring into today. But then there's this, man, there, there's, there's this hostility, there's racism, there's tension because of COVID and guidelines and everything else. And, and so I feel like there's, there's a fear and there's an anger and there's an anxiety that's happening right now. And we need to address that too. And so I was saying, how do we address both? How do we address the joy that we have in the gospel? And then yet the fact that we need to stand firm in the gospel. And so Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 20, we're going to look at the armor of God today. And so uh, if you are home, well, assume you're home, wherever you're at, I want to encourage you to go ahead and stand. Stand as we read God's word. We do this at Timberline because it's a way of reminding us of the truth of God's word, that it comes with God's full authority and power. So let me read. Verse 10, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand firm, stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth. And having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all power and supplication to that end. Keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth, boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Let me pray. Father, Father, we come to you now. And Lord, well, I'm excited. Many of us are going to be gathered together today in one place, experiencing just the unity of the body as we see each other, as we encourage one another, as we love one another. And as we do this, I just pray that we would praise you for the gospel that you've given us. But Lord, there's also, there's a fear, there's an anxiety, there's anger, there's rage, there's tension in our culture. And it seeps into us. I know that it does. I feel it within me. And so I pray that as we walk through your word today, that you would strengthen us. You would give us peace. That you would give us patience. That we would be reminded of the truths of the gospel. And that we would put on the full armor of God. God be glorified today. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Uh, all right, so what I want to do is I want to start with how do we get to Ephesians 6? Like, how do we get to the armor of God? So I'm going to do a quick run through through the book of Ephesians. Chapter 1 starts with us reading that we have been blessed by God in Christ with all the spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. We've been given everything. It talks about that right now Jesus is on his throne above every power, above every rule. And it talks about that he's uniting all things underneath him, underneath his rule right now. In chapter 2, we begin looking at our salvation a little bit more. And we read that we've been made alive in Christ. By his grace, he has saved us. And we've been sealed by his spirit. His spirit now dwells within us as the guarantee that we will be with Christ for all of eternity. And then in chapter 2, the second half, we read. That God doesn't just save Jews, but he saves Jews and Gentiles. And he, and he makes us into one new 
person, into a Christian, into a person uh, that is joined with the body of Christ, that God would dwell with us. And in chapter 3, we read that it's now through Christians, this new humanity that is made in Jesus, that God reveals his manifold wisdom in this world. And so then as we get to chapters 4, 5, and 6, uh, Paul fleshes out, so what does it look like for us to live out as this new humanity? And we see that we're now called the body of Christ, the bride of Christ. We've been united together that we build one another up in love. And now we think differently about work, about money, about our words, about sex. In fact, uh, in chapters 5, uh, going into chapter 6, Paul says, now we think differently about the home. And the relationships that we have, like husbands and wives and mothers and children. And at that time, they had slaves and, uh, and masters, which would be more equivalent just to bosses, employees in a sense today. But every relationship we have has now been transformed by Christ. And then we come to chapter 6, verse 10, and it says, Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. So, why? Is there something that opposes the church? Is there an enemy that we have? And what we read here in our Bible is that there is an enemy that wants to destroy every Christian. So who is? Who is this enemy? Well, we read in verse 11 that the devil has these schemes against the church. So one, we see the devil is our enemy. You need to notice when you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you are put into the very crosshairs of Satan himself, and he wants to destroy you. In verse 12, we read more about this enemy. We read that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So two things to note here. Number one, our enemy is the spiritual forces of darkness. So it's Satan and all of his minions. It's these powers of darkness that run rampant in our world, within our culture. In fact, if we were to go back to chapter 2, verse 3, uh, we would read that these powers are what direct and guide every believer. And guess what? That means that you and I, before we were saved, we, we also followed these powers. In fact, in chapter 2, verse 2, we followed the prince of the power of the air, which is Satan. So we were a part of this kingdom of darkness, following and being directed by this darkness. But when we believed in Jesus Christ, he took us out of the kingdom of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of light. That's why we're here. That's, that's why we gather as a church. That's one of the things we're reminded of when we get together is we look and we see we are citizens of God's kingdom, saved from the kingdom of darkness, that we would live in the kingdom of God, in the kingdom of light. It is these powers of darkness, though, that they're the very things that, that cause wars and incite governments, bring about division, death, destruction. These powers strive to thwart God's plans. They want to bring disunity and division within the church. So there's a very real enemy that we face. But we read something else also. Our enemy is not flesh and blood. So what does that mean? It means that our enemy is not black and white. Our enemy is not Republican, Democrat. Our enemy is not liberal, conservative. Our enemy, our enemy is not rich, poor. Our enemy is not you or me. It's not people. We need to know it's not your boss. It's not the person who did put on their mask. It's not the person who didn't put on their mask. See, we are gauged in a spiritual battle. When we think that people are the enemy, you know what happens? We will fail to give them the gospel of Jesus. When we think that people are enemies, 
then we will see them as obstacles to avoid and we will not see them as people who are made in the image of God who desperately need the gospel of Jesus Christ. We read in 2 Corinthians, I think it's 4, that Satan loves nothing more than trying to blind people, keep people from knowing and hearing the truth of the gospel. When we think of people as enemy, we won't give them the gospel. And that is what this world needs more than anything. Do, do you know that? I hope you know that truth. It is what has saved us, what has brought us uh, into relationship with God. It's what this world needs. Look, there is no amount of social justice, of social legislation that the world needs. It's not that those things are bad. What we need more than anything is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so, uh, and so what do we do? How is it that we are to stand firm against the enemy, this spiritual force of darkness? Well, what we read is we stand firm against the enemy by putting on the armor of God. Look at verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand firm. Verse 13. Take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand firm. The way we stand firm, the way we resist the enemy is by putting on the whole armor of God. The way we experience God's strength and power is by putting on the armor of God. Remember, verse 10 says, be strong in the Lord. So how are we strong in the Lord? He's not saying you be strong. He's not saying me be strong. He's saying we need God's strength. So the way we resist the enemy is experiencing the strength of God. And the way we experience the strength of God is by putting on the armor of God. And so... So one question that I have is how do we know that this armor of God is sufficient to actually withstand Satan, withstand these spiritual forces of darkness? Well, back earlier in Ephesians, in chapter 1, verse 21, we are told that Jesus right now sits far above every rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named not only in this age, but also in the one to come, meaning Jesus sits on a throne and is greater than everyone now and forever. There is no power that rivals his power. Jesus is greater and stronger than all the powers of darkness. And we're told in Colossians chapter 2, verse uh, 15, that at the cross and resurrection, he disarmed and defeated the spiritual powers of darkness. And remember, back in chapter 2 of Ephesians, when we experience the gospel, Jesus is the one who takes us out of the kingdom of darkness that we would now be citizens of the kingdom of God. So, when we're told to put on the armor of God, the armor of God is far greater than any power that this world has or any power, any spiritual power of darkness. So what does it mean to put on the armor of God? How do we do this? So, First, before we answer that question, let's just run through the armor. Paul gives us six pieces of armor that we are to put on. So let's look at what this, what this is. Number one, the belt of truth. What is this truth? Well, surely Paul is referring to the fact that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the Savior of the world. He is the one who offers us forgiveness. There is no other king. There is no other Savior. There is no other hope. So he's calling us to remember Jesus is king. Jesus is our Savior. This is why we're here. This is why we gather together. Because together we come and we, we praise Jesus together that he is our king, that he has saved us. Next, we read the breastplate of righteousness. Two things I want to say here. Number one, when we are saved, we read like in, in Romans chapter 3, that we are actually given the righteousness of God. So hear this. The reason that one day when, when Jesus returns and you can stand before him, the reason we are worthy to stand before Jesus is not because of anything you've done or I've done. Nothing, no accomplishments, past, present, or future. The only reason that we'll be able to stand before Jesus, our King, the Lord and Creator of all things, is because His 
righteousness is upon us. That's what happens at salvation. But I don't think that's all that Paul is talking about. I think he's also just talking about that when we are saved, we're given the Spirit of God that we would now live a new, a different life. That we would now live a life that pleases God. And so, uh, like in Romans chapter 6, verse 13, this is what we read. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. Here this. God saved you and I that we'd be a light in this world. In fact, in chapter uh, 5, 5, verse 8, Paul says in Ephesians, walk as children of light. When we are saved, we're to wake up each and every day knowing that we've been saved by the one true king that we would live different that we would live a life of love, a life of kindness, a life of peace, a life of patience. And the way we do that is not by our power, but by the Spirit who now dwells within us. Next, we read about the shoes of peace. Verse 15, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Now, this is not so much saying that you and I are to be a people of peace. That kind of falls more underneath the breastplate of righteousness. That we are to live in righteous lives. That we are to live a life that pleases God. Rather, what Paul is saying here is that we are to be a people ready to give the gospel of peace. In fact, if we go back to Ephesians chapter 2, this is what we read. Chapter 2, verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ. For he himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing hostility. And he came and preached peace to those who were far off and peace to those who were near. So Jesus came and preached Peace to those who are far, Gentiles, to those who are near, Jews. And it's this message of peace that makes us into one new person in Christ. So what is this peace? It's the gospel. It's that Jesus is the Savior of the world, who has left heaven, come to earth, that he would die on a cross, that you and I, if we would believe in him, we'd be forgiven. We'd be adopted into his family. And we'd experience all the riches and the blessings of God now and then all each and for all of eternity. So that's, uh, that is the message that you and I are to have. So in essence, what Paul is doing here is he's, he's kind of reminding us to do what Peter says in 1 Peter 3.15. Where Peter says this, always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is in you. Meaning, anyone who asks you, why do you live the way you do? Why do you go to church? Why do you love Jesus? We give them the gospel because we're ready to give the gospel of peace at all times. Now, I want you to just think about this. What keeps us from sharing the gospel? What keeps you from sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ? Why don't we evangelize more? Is it because we're afraid of what people will think, what they'll say, what they'll do? Is it because of a fear of man? I think, I think that's one of the primary reasons you and I and the church, we often struggle with sharing the gospel. And so what's the solution? What's the solution to our fear? It's to put on the armor of God. It's to put on the armor of God. Because when we put on the armor of God, we are strengthened by God. Remember, chapter 6, verse 10. Be strengthened in the Lord. Experience his strength and his might. How do we do that? Put on the armor of God. So if I'm going to overcome this fear of man, one of the things I need to do is put on the armor of God so that I won't fear man. But I'll be, I'll be ready to give the gospel of, the, of Jesus Christ. So if you want to share the gospel more, what you and I both need to do is make sure we are putting on the armor of God. And think about it. 
This is what the world needs. Look around us right now. I mean, there is, there is tension. There, there is rage. There is animosity. There is division. There is hatred. There is racism. But it's not just because of that. It's the, the social distancing and the COVID. There is just things that are happening right now. I, I've been feeling it this week. There is, there is like an anger that's raging within me. And I can feel it. It's ready to blow. I keep coming back on. All right, hold on here. What is happening in the culture, we're witnessing and we're seeing. If we're not careful, we can get caught up into the fear, into the anger, into the rage that is happening all around us. And yet, what is it that the world needs? Many people are saying, look, what we re need right now is more legislation, more social reform, more of this reform, and this reform, and this reform. And, and there probably is things that we need to do. And as Christians, we need to be good citizens of this world also. And think about how we vote. Think about how we're involved. But what is the thing that's actually going to be bring healing to hearts of anger, of rage, of division? What's going to heal the black and white divide? There's nothing but the gospel of Jesus Christ. For when, when we go to Revelation, we read. We read what the gospel does. It brings people from every tribe, tongue, nation, and language that we'd be gathered around the throne room of God in great joy and unity, praising Jesus, our King. In fact, one of the things that happens when we gather together as a church is we celebrate the diversity that we have. The fact that our one true King has united us who are of different colors different likes and dislikes, different hobbies, all of these things. But he brings us together as one new person in Christ. That's what the world needs. So I urge you, be putting on the armor of God every day that you would have those shoes of peace ready to share the gospel of peace. Because that is the cure of the world. Next, next we see that we have a shield of faith. Notice what we read in verse 16. This shield of faith extinguishes the flaming darts of the evil one. So, so what are these flaming darts? It could be a lot of things. It could be bitterness. It could be rage, loneliness, depression, gossip, slander, hatred, racism. It could be things like if you're not really saved. Just these deceiving thoughts. You're not really forgiven. Jesus doesn't really love you. He doesn't really want you. It could be fear. It could be anxiety. It could be false teaching. It could be lust. It could be sexual temptation. I mean, we could just keep going on and on and on. And the enemy wants nothing more than to shoot these darts at us all day long. Let me ask you, do you, do you feel these darts? Do you feel the sting of them in your life? Do you feel them at times having an effect? Causing you to doubt, causing you to be anxious, causing you to be fearful, causing you to be angry. So, so how does this shield, this shield of faith extinguish, put out the flames of these darts? Remember, we have said, Many times, and we did it when we went through the book of Habakkuk, to live by faith is to trust in the promises of God. And so to take up the shield of faith is to trust in the very promises of our God. And so I want to I just give you one example. One of the verses that I've been memorizing and as I was wrestling just with this sermon, it just kind of came into my mind, was Isaiah chapter 43, verse 25. And there God says, I, I am he who blots out your transgressions and I will not remember them anymore. I just want you to think about the goodness of that. When you're struggling with, does God still love me? I know I've asked for forgiveness. I know that he is my king and my Lord, but, but how do I know that on that day when I stand before him, he's going to love me? How do I know he's not going to bring up this laundry list of sins and say, you know, you, you actually weren't worthy. You actually weren't good enough. 
There's so many people that I think as, as we approach death, we fear death because we're afraid, are we really saved? Is Jesus really going to bring us into the kingdom? And so when we have those fears, what do we do? We take Isaiah 43, 25, and we go, wait a minute. At the cross of Jesus Christ, upon believing in Jesus, God says, look, your sins are blotted out. I don't remember them anymore. I've placed upon you the breastplate of righteousness. And when I look at you, I see my son, Jesus. That's how we overcome fear. That's how we overcome the anxiety of death. And are we saved in Christ? And we're to do that with all the promises of God. So if we're going to do that, if we're going to pick up the shield of faith, you know what you need? You need to know the promises of God. Where are the promises of God? They're found in the word of God. So we're going to get back to that in just a few moments. The next thing we have is the helmet of salvation. Do you know whom you belong to? Do you know whom you belong to? The helmet of salvation reminding ourselves every day, I am a child of God. I have been saved by the grace of Jesus through faith in Christ. We need to remind ourselves of that, that I am a citizen of of the kingdom of God. I am no longer of the kingdom of darkness. I can stand firm against these enemies because of who I am in Jesus Christ. We need to remind ourselves each and every day who we are, whom we belong to. We do that by placing the helmet of salvation upon our heads every day that we would think rightly about who we are and how we live in this world. Next, we take up the sword of the Spirit. Look at verse 17. We read, the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. And it's through the Word that we are saved. It's through the Word that we will continue to be saved and to be strengthened against these spiritual forces of darkness and that we will live a life worthy of the kingdom of God. So we're going to do this. And, and, and if you've, you've been a part of Timberline for any length of time. I feel like I say it like every week. We need to know the word. We need to love the word. We need to meditate on the word. We need to memorize the word. This word right here is God's grace given to us. That we would know him. That we would know his promises. That we would know how to live a life worthy of him. Oh, I encourage you. Know this word. You cannot set enough time aside to know this word each and every day. And then pray that you would go and live out this word. So, so let's go back to our question. We asked a little bit ago. How is it that we put on the armor of God? Well, we put on the armor of God by continually applying the truths of the gospel. Think about it. That's what we did as we just described the armor of God. We were applying the truths of the gospel. Look, the armor of God reminds us that Jesus is the Savior of the world. The armor of God reminds us that we are saved by Jesus alone. We are adopted into his kingdom, made citizens in his kingdom. The armor of God reminds us that we are now salt and light in this world, that the Spirit dwells within us, that we would live a new life. The armor of God reminds us that we are ambassadors here on this earth proclaiming the news of our King Jesus Christ. The armor of God reminds us that we are not slaves to sin, but we've been freed in Christ. The armor of God reminds us of the necessity of knowing God's word, that we would not be deceived by sin. The armor of God reminds us that this world is not our eternal home. The armor of God reminds us that we stand firm, not by your strength, not by my strength, but by the strength of God. Re All we've done by going through the armor of God is reminded ourselves of the gospel. That's what it is every day. Reminding ourselves of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But let's get a little more practical. So I can imagine that you're saying, okay, there's an enemy. The way we resist the enemy is by putting on the armor of God. The way we put on the armor of God is by applying the truths of the gospel. What does that look like? How, how exactly can we do that? Should we do that? Well, 
Paul, Paul helps us out. We keep reading. Prayer is the means in which we put on the armor of God. Prayer is the means in which we apply the truths of the gospel. Look, look at verse 18. It goes right from talking at the sword of the Spirit to praying at all times in the Spirit. Paul is connecting the armor of God with prayer. In fact, we could say prayer is the means in which we put on the armor and we wield the sword of the Spirit. It's through prayer. Unfortunately, and I know you know this, and I say this is true of me at times also. As Christians, we have often relegated prayer to that thing that we do like right before we eat or right before we go to bed. And I wonder, have we, have we lost the wonder and the power of prayer? Have we trivialized it? Do we think of it more like the children's game telephone? It's cute. One of them says something, and then the next one says something, and you see if it gets all the way around, and it's fun to do. But does it really accomplish anything? Have we trivialized prayer? Or do we think of it? John Piper has been real helpful for me and just the way he talks about prayer. Do we think about it as this wartime walkie-talkie between the troops and the general? And it's as we, as we call out to our, our generals, we call out to Jesus Christ that he equips us, that he strengthens us. It's the very means in which he keeps us alive. Do we view prayer as necessary, as powerful? Look at what comes next. Paul says we are to bring every prayer and supplication to God. Paul is saying we are to bring everything to God. Every problem, every pain, every need, every struggle, every thought, every relationship, every situation we are to bring to God. So if we're going to, if we're going to put on the armor of God, we're to pray. We need to be praying and bring everything to God. So, so what does that mean? Well, let me go to the next one first. We keep reading. We read this. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. So what we read now is that prayer is the means in which we help the church to stand firm against the enemy. So it's not just how I put on the armor of God for me, but it's how I help others put on the armor of God also. Get this. If you're going to stand firm, if I'm going to stand firm, if we're going to resist the schemes of the devil, if we're going to respond rightly to racism and the hate in this world, if we're not going to be caught up in anxiety and fear, then it'll be because you and I are praying for one another. Hear this. What I need from you and what you need from me is that we would pray. We need to pray for one another. I need your prayers from my life what your family needs from you, what your wife, your children, your husband, your parents, you know what they need from you more than anything else is for you to be praying for them. That, that you would pray that you yourself would put on the armor of God and that you would pray that they would put on the armor of God. And so what does that look like? Well, I want you to think about it. Each and every day as we pray, and we wake up and go, God, I pray that I would know that you are the Savior of the world. I want to know that I don't want that truth to move from my mind. Father, as I go to, to work today, I know that there's hostility. I know that there's division because of the racism and because of the guidelines, because of COVID-19. And, and there are people who are tense. And I know that people are just waiting just to snap at each other. So Father, help me. Help me to make sure I have the breastplate of righteousness on today. That I would love them. That I would be a person of patience and peace, and kind, and gentle with my words. Help me to be salt and light at work. Or perhaps you're saying, God, I know that I need to share the gospel with this person. Help me as I go today. Help me to put on the shoes of peace that I would share the gospel with this person. Pray that your children would put on the shoes of peace and they would share the gospel with those around them. Pray that we would take up the sword or the, or the shield of faith. Pray for yourself. Pray for others. Lord, I know I'm struggling with anxiety right now. 1 Peter 5 says that we can cast all our anxiety on you because you care for me. God, I, I'm struggling because of, of COVID, because of racism, because of relationships, because everything's tense. 
Lord, help me to take up the shield of faith. Help me to trust that you are with me. Help me to trust that you can take my anxiety right now. Help me to experience your grace and your peace and your comfort in my heart right now. You see, that's how we apply the armor of God, the, the gospel to ourselves and to others. And we do it every single day. And sometimes a lot each day. Probably not sometimes, probably every day. That is what that looks like. Just walk through the armor of God and pray each and every day. But I want to read. We're not done yet. What we read in verses 19 and 20, Paul says, Also pray for me, that words may be given to me, and opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Prayer is the means in which the kingdom of God will advance in this world. Paul says, pray for me. Pray that I will be bold. Pray that I won't be fearful. Pray that I'll open my mouth. Pray that I'll speak. Why? So more people will know the gospel of Jesus. Hear this. We're gathered here today. Many of us are at the building. You're at home. But we're gathered today because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're in a global pandemic, experiencing global isolation, wrestling with global racism because it's everywhere. There's one thing this world needs, and it's the gospel. And what we understand is that the death and resurrection of Christ, the, the kingdom of God came into this world, and it's going to continue to advance until the point that one day Jesus will return, and he's going to return and gather all those who have believed in him. And you know how the kingdom is going to keep advancing? You know how we're to live between the cross and resurrection and the return of Christ? We're to be praying the armor of God. Because as we put on the armor of God on ourselves and on others, we're praying for the advancement of the kingdom of God to continue to move forward in this world. Knowing that there is no spiritual darkness that can thwart the plans of God. There's no spiritual darkness that can overcome the power and the rule of Jesus. So I want to encourage you, let us be full of praise today as we, rem as we remember and we recite the truths of the gospel through the armor of God. Let us do that on a daily basis and let us apply these truths to ourselves, to one another, and let us pray that the kingdom of God advances. Listen, the way that you and I are going to be salt and light, the way that we're going to stand firm, the way that we're not going to be deceived, it's not by your strength and my strength. It's by the strength of Jesus. And as we apply the truths of the gospel, through the power of the Spirit, we're going to experience His grace, His power, and His strength in us each and every day. So let us, let us put on the armor of God. So I'm going to pray, and then we're going to go ahead and close. Our Father, oh Father, we thank you for the gospel that saved us. We thank you for the gospel that we know is the hope of this world. And we pray that you will use this gospel to continue to advance in this world, saving more and more and more people. And Lord, I pray right now for the church, especially for our church, Timberline, but for the church in America. Let us be bold right now in the gospel. Let us put on the armor of God that we would not be struck by the flames of the evil one, but that we would pick up the shield of faith. We'd put on the shoes of peace and we would stand and we'd proclaim the gospel. And may we put on the breastplate of righteousness that we would display your love every day. And God, I pray, help us to live out these truths. Help the world to see the beauty of your gospel through our lives. And may they hear the power of the gospel through our words. Father, I pray, help us to be a church that puts on the, God, the, the armor of God. May we pray it for one another. May we stand firm. May your kingdom continue to advance. Father, we look forward to the day that you return. Come, Jesus, 